Okay, so the Hammerlin CB23. Uh, obviously, no, I have not. Uh, <laughs> I have not uh, stuck a stick of dynamite inside the customer's radio, and this is the remains. <laughs> this is another radio. Um, for starters, um, so if you watched the first video, you saw you know, we've got the big, big, tw the big spike at the you know whatever mixing crystal we happen to be using in a 25 megahertz range. The frequency we want on CB channel is extremely low, and then there's a uh, basically a carbon copy of that signal at the 20. I don't think I even moved the peak cursor over to that. It's I guess that would be a 23, 24 megahertz. You know, whatever your uh, 25 megahertz mixing crystal would be minus uh, you know 1.6575 or 85 megahertz. You know that that other lower peak to the left. Um, now, to answer some questions uh, people would ask in the other video, uh, did you check the tubes? I should have said some of the straightforward things. I guess just I figured people would realize I already did. So, yes, all of the tubes had been tested. Actually, the first thing I do before <laughs> a tool ever touches a radio in a vacuum tube radio is that's the first thing I do. Pull all the tubes, test them all on a, uh, usually on like my triplet or Westmore, uh, laboratory mutual conductance tube testers um, or a Hickok or any of my I've got a lot of really high-end tube testers but I'll test it on one of those um, they all tested fine now after I realized I was having problems I even went so far as to install brand new tubes or you know new old stock in the uh, mixers and uh, oscillator circuits so all of those had been swapped out yep exactly the same so I just put the original ones back in that I had already tested um, now here's one interesting thing I did find. Now the alignment procedures back then, because this radio was made probably in like 63, somewhere around there, actually, here's a easy way to tell, yeah, 63, here's, now this, <laughs> obviously, this is not out of the customer's radio, this is a parts, uh, one I have for parts, but, here we get the camera to focus on it, you can see that says, what, 363, so, you know, this radio that I parted out here, crystals were made in 1963 so somewhere in 1963 64 range let's say when that radio was made uh, back then oscilloscopes were not a common tool to see on repair benches like nowadays i mean hell a lot of hobby <laughs> guys that do electronics as a hobby nowadays will have an oscilloscope because you can pick up a good used one on ebay for next to nothing um but back then not a common tool, and very expensive, especially compared to the price even a new one costs you nowadays. Back then, that was the, you know, that was the Cadillac of tools to have in a, on your repair bench was the oscilloscope. So, the alignment procedure doesn't use a scope. It uses only a vacuum tube voltmeter and a watt meter. Um, what you do is use the, you're just taking voltage measurements, and you're peaking each uh, at each coil, when you're adjusting the coils, you're adjusting for peak voltage, for the voltage peak. Um, and I had done that. That was, and so the results that you saw on the screen of the spectrum analyzer and everything you saw on the scope there, that was having a factory alignment done. When I realized I was having problems, I even went back over it a couple times just to make sure <laughs> you know, I didn't screw something up. Um, so I had gone through the alignment procedure several times in the transmit and mixer and oscillator circuits, and it's it's dead nuts on as close as you can you know, basically humanly uh, you know as humanly possible on uh, on you know going by their alignment procedure. But I thought, well, I got it hooked up to the spectrum analyzer. They didn't have fancy tools like that back then, or at least especially on uh, you know. Joe Snuffy's, you know, normal repair bench, you know, at the, the local radio TV repair shop. Um, well, we just happen to have, of course, as you saw, we have spectrum analyzers, lots of oscilloscopes, all kinds of fancy equipment, so why don't we put some of that to use? So I thought, why don't I just try and do the transmit alignment, um, the, actually the oscillators and the, the transmit alignment using only the spectrum analyzer. So what I wanted to try and do was, was get because remember we had three peaks really big i'm not giving you the middle finger <laughs> honestly i'm not but we had really big peak the 25 megahertz and then we had a little small one on the cb channel and then the other one like i say that would be at the minus one point uh, you know in, in the instance of 
the example I was using in the previous video, that would have been one minus 1.75 megahertz. So we had the 25 megahertz mixing crystal, plus 1.75 megahertz, and minus 1.75 megahertz. Um, so what I thought I would do was see if I could, with a spectrum analyzer, go through, adjust all of the oscillator, um, basically all of the, the alignment points for the transmit circuit and oscillators and mixers and everything using the spectrum analyzer. And surprisingly enough, I can pretty much, I guess you'd call it squelch out or remove or filter out pretty much everything and bring up the 27 megahertz. Um, the problem is, is when I do that, the, I do increase the 27 megahertz, and I can pretty much completely eliminate uh, all that other crap we don't want. The problem is the output power drops down. Now, uh, these radios were rated, now for starters, you have to realize this is an old radio. The FCC rolls back when these, you know, granted this is a pile of parts, but <laughs> you know when this pile of parts was still a radio when it was made, uh, output power specifications were nothing like they are nowadays. Nowadays, they actually rate a CB radio by a maximum amount of transmit power. On AM, that's 4 watts. You're allowed a maximum of 4 watt carrier and at 100% modulation then. Um, back when, uh, in the old tube days, what they rated it at was input power. And a lot of people will see 5 watts. Man, why the old radios, they can do more power or they do more power. They're rated for five watts. No, 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 no. Common misconception if you're not, for, you really have to read the fine print. If you look at it, it will say five watts input. That's how much power is being used to create your output power. Uh, the output power, now, this hammer, the Hammerlin manual, matter of fact, let me pause the video. Actually, let me go grab that. Okay, so we have the factory manual. This is, like I say, slightly bug-eaten. You know, got a whole few holes in it where you know, somebody's been munching on this thing over the decades. But, uh, so you can see here, 2.5 watts. Now, this is power output. 2.5 watts minimum over a complete range of 23 channels for the legal, because that's what was regulated, legal input of 5 watts. <laughs> so you could use 5 watts. They, the FCC wasn't regulating how much power got out. They knew there was no human human way possible to get more than five watts because you were only allowed five watts, you know, maximum input power, and you're always going to have losses. So, but these these radios, so you know, Hammerlin rated them at minimum two and a half watts over the you know, full range of 23 channels. Now, the output power total, you know, measured on a watt meter, uh, with that signal you saw in the last video, was right around probably three and a quarter or three and a half watts. So I know the radio can do it because it was doing it. It was just kind of spread all over the place. And most of it was in the wrong, in the wrong band. Um, but like I say, once I aligned it using only the spectrum analyzer, I can get rid of all that crap pretty much. It's still a little bit there, but it's nowhere close to what it was. I mean, it's literally almost non-existent looking at it on the spectrum analyzer. But like I say, the, the output power, you're now down to about a watt. So it, it, it's still, I'm going to have to go through and tinker with it. Um, I had gone through and checked all the resistors, uh, service manual again. Let me pull it back out here. Hammerlin was nice enough that their service manual has, like most of the good old service manuals for anything tube type, they have your voltage chart, so you know, your receive and transmit has the, you know, voltages for every single tube at every pin, and they also have a resistance chart, so you know, with the radio obviously off, set to controls like they tell you, and then you just measure from each tube pin socket to chassis ground, and these are the readings you should get. Um, I'd gone through and measured the resistance, they were all fine. I even had lifted a few legs of a few resistors, tested them, everything was fine. The only ones I ended up changing were the ones for some of the main power supply dropping resistors off the B positive rail. And that's just because they were slightly baked. Uh, they get hot to start with. Um, so, a lot of people had said uh, in the comments section of that last video, uh, SMD, silver... Uh, Silver mica disease or silver migration, it's a common problem. I've run into it myself before, and I was kind of thinking, oh, yeah, it's a possibility. Uh, the problem is, in these radios, now I happen to have, this isn't the customers, this is, which is kind of obvious. You saw what the other one looked like. 
this is another radio, but uh, so these two transformers right here, the problem is to get these blasted things out. This, they're underneath of this blasted wafer switch assembly. So, I mean, man, they're really crammed down in there. So I really didn't want to have to pull out the customer's uh, double tune transformer cans there unless I absolutely have to. So I was going to pull one out of that chassis right there, actually. And then I thought, you haven't checked your inventory sheet yet. So I went and checked my inventory sheet. And sure enough, at some point in time, I had already completely dismantled one. And I'm not, after I got to looking at this pile of parts, I remembered, yes, this was one that I had gotten, didn't have a cover, and the transformer had caught on fire. It just needed way too much work, wasn't worth fixing. So it's been parted out and had it on the shelf. Shelf number 182, it's box number 7 on shelf 182. So pulled this out have all the cans. So, great. I already have some of these double-tuned transformer cans, the actual ones in question. And what I was interested to see was, was what type of capacitors they have inside of them. Are they the kind of silver micas that are prone to uh, having that problem or not? And the answer is, no, they are not. It's not, uh, for starters, not plastic tubes. It's the old fiber-type tubes. Um, they're not the capacitors that are basically built into the base of the capacitor and are part of the, you know, it's a part of the whole assembly, a purpose-built cap in that, you know, part of that can. This is the old school style, the very reliable kind. It's literally nothing more than two coils, because remember this is double-tuned, so this top section is used for the receive circuit and this bottom coil, which is the heavier gauge wire, this is the one that's used for transmit. So both of these coils Use it as two, I just showed you to sit really close to each other. The bottom halves are the transmit circuit. The top halves are the receive circuit. Now you'll see there is a silver mica there. There is a hundred and... Get the camera to focus. There's a hundred and thirty picofarad. Come on, camera. i get the reflection just right here. There we go. Hundred and thirty picofarad, plus or minus ten percent. Well, actually, no. <laughs> That's not the right capacitor. That capacitor is attached to the top coil. Well, that's receive. If we spin it in one direction or the other here, yeah, there we go. There is a ceramic capacitor back here. This is the one that is in parallel. Now, this one here is in series with this coil. So, actually, the one lead goes down to the common center uh, terminal here, goes up to the coil, comes down from that coil, goes to the silver mica cap, and then out. The transmit circuit, this uh, ceramic capacitor, is in parallel with this coil. So, kind of hard to test it on, you know, with the capacitor, with the LC meter here. So, what I actually did was, and was it this one, or was it the other one? Yeah, it was the other one. Yeah, this one, because I haven't, I haven't resoldered it yet. I actually still had the lead desoldered. I wrapped it back around. But you can see that leads unsoldered because I had actually unhooked it and and checked it just to be sure that you know it'd be rare. I mean it's it's rare for this type of silver mica cap to go bad. But like I said, we don't have to worry about it because that's attached to the receive side. Uh, it's even rarer for a ceramic cap to go bad. But I thought, well, we'll just check these because uh, this one this one would be a good example. This radio was in horrendous condition. It looked like it had been stored in a damp basement its whole life. Um, after it had caught on fire. So, yeah, it was in pretty horrendous condition. So, especially when it comes to storage conditions for something electronic. Um, so, you know, I thought I'd check it. It checks right at it because it's an NPO rated capacitor, uh, 20 picofarad, and it's fine. So, I, I've pretty much convinced myself by seeing what type of transformers and coils they're using that, yeah, there's probably nothing wrong with these double tuned transformers. This is the the reliable kind. It's not those ones where the capacitor is built into the base where it's a layer, you know, it's layered into the base down there. Um, I've seen some that have a little tubular style. They, they can be unreliable and some other kinds, but yeah, this style here, the capacitor that's actually would be our consumer for the transmit circuits, an NPO rated ceramic, and yeah, <laughs> I'm going to say it's probably not the problem. Um, now, like I say, I've aligning it with the spectrum analyzer I was able to get rid of almost all that crap and get the the 27 megahertz, you know, whatever channel I happen to be transmitting on. I was able to get that peak up, but not up far enough because, like I said, I, I can only get a maximum of about one watt. So, 
I need to go in and do some more sniffing around. Um, you know, take some voltage measurements, do a little bit more signal tracing, and, you know, just tinker around with the alignments. I get the feeling that uh, it's just a really weird circuit, the way they have this thing set up. The alignment procedure, like I say, it's kind of archaic. <laughs> it was in 1960, you know, in the early 60s. Um, so, yeah, I need to tinker with it some more, but, yeah, I'm I'm kind of relieved to see that it's the reliable kind. So I'm, yeah, I'm not going to bother pulling the cut unless it's last resort. Unless I get down to where the only thing that could possibly be causing the problem are these transformers. Then I'll, and even then all I really need to do is uh, pop a, well, no, because that one is hooked up inside. So yeah, but yeah, like I said, I just, I really, really doubt those, those are bad. Now that I see what kind they are. Um, so I just wanted to update that, you know, it's not fixed yet um, and it hasn't been forgotten. Uh, still, you know, it's still being worked on. Um, it's just a matter of uh, tracking down a problem. So, uh, like I say, I'm getting closer because you know, I got rid of most of that crap. It's just, yeah, when I do that, the power drops down. So, we'll see what we find, and uh, I will definitely update. I'll come back with another video and uh, you know, let you know exactly what I found, and, <laughs> you know, to actually fix the problem. And to everybody that's uh, posted comments to my last video, thanks for the help. Um, like. It was. I don't want to say that was a venting video. You know, but I would have done this anyhow. And it's just. It never hurts to have somebody else might have worked on one of those at one point in time and has had that exact problem and knew. It never hurts to ask. You know, uh, it's one thing I learned a long time ago. It doesn't cost anything to ask because there might be somebody out there that has a has seen the exact same problem. Um, you know, can save yourself some hassle, and you can learn something. I mean, you're never too old, too old to learn. Doesn't matter how much you know about anything. Trust me, there's always going to be somebody out there that knows more than you, and there's plenty of people out there that know one hell of a lot more about electronics than I do. Um, I learn stuff every day, and I'm sure even those people learn stuff every day. They're just getting even smarter than I am. <laughs> but uh, so uh, appreciate all everybody that's left comments. So. Uh, We'll get her figured out eventually.